measures get measured, right? Safety performance, work culture. Does anybody here care about how many we may deliver, right? So with all of that going on, does anybody care to guess what one of my biggest priorities would be? Safety. We're all, so safety is certainly a big priority, right? People, also a big priority. But for the gentleman that shouted out safety, I have a hat. And I have a hat for a couple reasons. Number one, thank you uh, for shouting out the first answer. And there's going to be other chances to get hats during the presentation. But I'm going to back up for a second. When you're in my shoes and you have to follow great plant directors that were before, like there's this guy, Kai Spandy, I hear that's around somewhere, right? <laughs> Jeff LaMarche, Will Cooksey, whoever it is. The only way I can drive improvement is I've got to give out better swag, right? That has to be the way. <laughs> that has to be the way. So there'll be an opportunity to participate and maybe get another E-Ray hat or two as we go along. But back to my priorities. When I'm in manufacturing for General Motors, I don't have a choice. I have to deliver everything, right? For our customers, for our company, for our shareholders, it's not a choice. I can't do that by myself. So my priority ends up being supporting the employees. And our employees in Bowling Green, you've been on plant tours, you can see the pride they have in building America's supercar, right? They know that already. I'm broadening that to help them realize that not only do they build a car that makes our customer happy, but Corvettes send happiness into the world. And if you don't believe me, look at the reaction on people when you pull your car into a parking lot. Do people shun their eyes and look away? No, right? They smile, they give you positive body language. They may even want to meet you. You may have a new friend, right? So I want to pipe that happiness back into the plant. I want the folks on every job, every shift to understand that we build America's supercar and it makes the world happy. And I want to connect them to what matters. That's my priority because with a workforce like that, I can deliver anything, right? There is no doubt. So moving on, um, please click to the next slide. I have a trivia question, all right? Click again. Price is right rules. So unfortunately, we as a world recently lost Bob Barker, right? 99 years old, so shout out to him. Price is right rules, here's the question. Click again for me, please. How many plant directors has Bowling Green Assembly seen? You gonna fix that for me, Rachel? Five. Five? Six. Six, keep going. All right, I need to see a hand so I know who to hand the hat to. Seven, keep going higher. Here we go, I heard a nine, where was the nine? All right, still need to go higher. 10, right there. There we go, 10 is it. I am the 10th plant director for Bowling Green Assembly. Congratulations, you win an E-Ray hat as well. So if you click again for me, please. All right, so believe it or not, um, the presentation's not about me, and I know that probably upsets a lot of folks. What it's going to be about is what does it take in manufacturing to launch a vehicle? I wanna talk about that today. So click again, please. So before manufacturing ever gets a hold of the car to build, the enterprise is a flurry with activity, right? We think about our customers that we have. What do our customers want? We might even think about the customers we don't have and how do we have those customers too, right? We think about technology and regulation and many different things to come up with a good business case for, hey, what car do we want to build next, right? What car do our customers want us to build next? And a lot of that happens before manufacturing ever gets their hand in it. But go ahead and click to the next slide, please. So once manufacturing gets involved, we have a golden rule. And the golden rule is there can be no rookies on the launch team, right? No newbies, no rookies, not a learning assignment. Because running a factory is difficult enough, but inventing a way to build a car that has never been built before raises the order of magnitude of work quite a bit, right? It is a big technical challenge. And because it is our biggest technical challenge, we do not allow rookies on the launch team. So we start with, yeah, I'm gonna click it back a couple. Um, we start with our plant launch operations manager. And I gotta tell you that for Bowling Green Assembly, it's somebody who maybe some of you know, his name is Johnny Andrews, he's here in the audience. He is the best in the business, bar none. And it's not just me saying that because I'm a fan of Corvette and Bowling Green Assembly. Lots of people will acknowledge that. He is the best. And he's the best because he's launching the crown jewel, right? Makes sense to have the best there. And then John picks a team, again, no rookies, of a whole bunch of really competent people around him. Because we have to engage with lots of different functions, right? We have to make sure the quality's right. We have to make sure all the shops in the plant are right. We have to train hourly and salary. 
we need to make sure that the line is engineered properly to build the vehicle at rate, right? So we establish a very big team. Trust me, these bubbles are only representative, right? There's a very big team to launch the vehicle in the factory. So now another trivia question. GM, has anybody ever heard of GM jargon, right? We have a lot of acronyms. We have a lot of codes. We have a lot of ways that we talk. And I bet that it's possible that a couple GM folks could be having a conversation and you could be standing right there with them and not understand a word of what they say because there's so much jargon, right? And here's what I'm gonna promise you is that in the launch space especially, the jargon goes up exponentially, right? There's tons of words that we've just frankly made up and sometimes the meaning changes depending on context, right? It's just crazy. So that gets me to prices right rules again. Here's the next question. Oh. <laughs> okay, so no hat for that one, maybe, I don't know. Everybody see that? So believe it or not, in the official GM acronym dictionary, there are 17,924 acronyms, right? So if launching a car wasn't hard enough already, <laughs> you also have to learn a new language, right? All right, so now it's time for manufacturing to get involved. And the very first step that we get involved with is called virtual review. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a second. But keep in mind, this presentation is gonna be about the manufacturing lane of how to launch a vehicle. The rest of the enterprise is a flurry with activity as well to get the world ready to have this vehicle birthed, all right? But the focus of what I'm gonna talk about is the manufacturing space. So the virtual reviews are very important. This is 3D math data that the you know, engineering design and manufacturing teams come together to analyze, to figure out how to build this car. Not only does it tell us, will the car physically go together, but it looks for things like what is showing up here on this upper right picture circled in red. That's a socket extension that we can't get to the fastener we need because there's a line in the way. So we're actually looking at, is there enough hand space? Do the tools fit? And we prefer to find as much of that as we can in this space because it's cheapest to fix then, right? Then we're just moving bits around in a computer and we can come up with a solution before things get real. All right, the next step is early slow build. This does not take place in the factory. This is typically at our pre-production operations, um, which are in Michigan. And at this moment, we may not even have the real physical parts. What we may have is 3D printed parts, right? Or stereolithography parts or other things but what we're trying to do is, okay, we did it math, right? We learned a whole bunch of stuff. We changed a whole bunch of stuff. The math looks good. Now let's get some parts. Let's put it together and see if we can actually figure out how to make this car go, right? So we practice putting it together and we figure out things like, what is the precedent of build for the parts, right? Are there certain things that have to go on before other things and, and how does that look and do we wanna change anything? And that's what happens when we get to the first early slow build. Then we move on to the first physical build. So here, we're collaborating with this group that's called the PPO builders, the pre-production operation builders. Those folks actually are very experienced at building the next new thing for General Motors. They get to lay hands on the, the next first thing first. So they're very good at identifying problems with new products, right? Because that's what they do for a living. But here's the thing. They're not the experts on putting together a Corvette, right? Our folks in Bowling Green are the experts at putting together a Corvette. So we send our folks to work with their folks on those first early builds because we want the best solution overall. So in that space, this slow build, it's not on an assembly line, right? It's we try to use at least concepts or preferably the real production tooling and we actually put the car together in a slow fashion. And what you're seeing in the upper left is actually one of the first goes at putting a battery into an E-Ray, all right? This was not in Bowling Green Assembly. This is when the team was practicing way back when, hey, how will this work, all right? So again, it's every, everybody working together and it's the first tryouts of the tools. It's actually validating that um, the order of operations will work and we have an idea of how to put the car together. And that was a, a battery going up into an E-Ray. Okay, now we're ready to move from those slow build play, uh, phrases place at uh, pre-production operations into the plant. And at this point, and I'm gonna click again and talk while the video's running, you can see three different videos. This is not online in the plant, but it's physically in the heart of the plant, um, well hidden from prying eyes. 
And here we're working on the process in the plant and we're using as much of the production tooling as available, preferably all of it. You can see that even though it's not on a line, you'll see an AGV um, bringing in for marriage, right? You'll see that we have the carrier up above. We're really working out our process because here's the thing. When we launch a car, it's gonna go on an assembly line with other products that's being produced. And there's no one in this room that likes it when we hit the brakes and stop producing product, right? So once we get the new car to the line, it has to be able to run at a reasonable pace so that we can keep up producing the existing product. So we practice offline. And when we practice offline, these parts are very expensive, right? They're prototype parts. Some of them weren't built on production tooling. They may be pro um, prototype tooling. And what we do is we put the car together. Oh, we learned a whole bunch of stuff. We've got some better ideas. We take the car back apart. We put the car together again. Right? Oh, we learned a whole bunch of things. We're gonna take it apart. Hey, we want to time something, take a video, right? Standardized work, whatever. We take it apart. We put it back together again, right? Because we're practicing. It gets real before we take it to the assembly line. We want it to be perfect. So here's another trivia question that I didn't put too many times, so that's a good thing. So that plant slow build for the C8, who would like to speculate for an E-Ray hat on how long that took? Two weeks. Two weeks is we two weeks is close, but a little too short. Three weeks, who was that? Bingo, we have a winner. All right, congratulations. It was a three week process to do that first uh, plant slow build for the C8. All right, so now we're moving on, right? We've, we've got kind of the vehicle figured out, we have the tooling figured out, but it's very important that we validate everything. And then we put it on the line and it's the first build on the line. And some of you may have seen this video before because this video has been out there, but I think it's spectacular and I wanted to show it again. This is literally that first C8 going down the assembly line for Bowling Green Assembly. And there's some things that really stand out to me as I watch this video that are true of this step in the process. Number one is you're gonna see a ton of teamwork. There's way more people around this car than would be around the car during a normal build day, right? Because it's teamwork to put it together but there's also many, 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 many checks going on to make sure we're putting it together correctly, that we're gathering the correct quality data, that the process is putting it together correctly. And oh, by the way, even though this is the first um, build, when you watch this video, you're gonna see a C7 right near it, right? And you're gonna see how close together they were. We certainly allow extra time in our production schedule because we will stop to get this right when we need to, but the idea is to keep the plant running as we build this first build. And this is the first car going down the line. And I think the video paused. I don't know if that was me. Can we go back to that? Because I'd like to see the end of that clip, if we could. So here we go, right? We're putting it together. The other important piece to note here is some security pieces, right? Um, you can see that we're applying camo right as we build the car. For many people in the factory, this is the first time they've actually seen the car as well. But still, we want everything to be released in time, right? And when it is ready. So we actually camel the cars, we're building it. There's security there, make sure nobody's taking pictures, right? Make sure the right things happen as it goes. And then there's this magic moment, right? And this is the moment. I had to ask, hey, did we stage it? No, we invited everybody to come over, but that's Taj driving right there. And some folks might recognize, I think it's Kai in the passenger seat. This is when you hit the button to drive the car off the line. And that's the first one down the line. That is super impressive, right? First time you've built it in your manufacturing process, hit the button and the car drives off the line. It was not a tow it off the line. To me, I feel like we should applaud right there for John Andrews and the team that pulled that off, right? I, I, I think that's brilliant. And let me tell you, that is a testament to the launch team and all that practice and um, effort that they put in ahead of time to be able to integrate that into the line that's already running other product. It is nothing short of a miracle. All right, so now that's done, right? We've got one down the line. And believe me, there was a crowd there and that crowd was happy for a reason, right? Because now we know it's possible, right? We know it's possible to build that car. We know it's possible to build it in our process, but there's a lot more work to be done because we have to train people, right? We have to train everybody and we have to train them well because every car that is presented to them for work has to be done correctly. And oh, by the way, to hit our business metrics, it has to be done within cycle time. It has to be done safely. Right? It has to be done with quality. And so we build more properties. We build more properties for training, 
But we also build properties to send back to engineering to do durability testing, to testing, to do validation testing, to make sure the car is gonna be right in the field under a variety of circumstances for our customers. And then we get into a build bucket that's called non-saleable. These vehicles, and, and this is kind of the sad point, everything I talked about from the very beginning through this non-saleable bucket, and I should mention that each of these exercises, especially in the validation stage and the non-saleable phase, it's not just one vehicle that we build, right? We build lots of iterations where we learn and then we run a car down again, but it's in the same phase of development. And all the way up to non-saleable, including non-saleable, those cars either get crushed or crashed when we're done. So we do crash testing, or they were cars that were not ready for public consumption, they're not ready, so we end up crushing them when we are done. It's a little bit heartbreaking, but it's important to get the car right and to make sure everything is safe with quality once the car is finished. So we get through the non-saleable phase. And it's in non-saleable into the next um, stage that's called saleable. Somewhere in that space, all right, is where you might see a new car driving around Bowling Green that doesn't have camo on, all right? Some place in that space is a spot that you'll see people like me in test vehicles, like the one I have parked in the parking lot, by the way, it's a beautiful Riptide Blue E-Ray that's parked right by the sidewalk out there, convertible if you happen to see it, um, that you'll start to see us to drive it around because we're in the final phase of testing, right? The car is safe, it's street legal, right? It's a good car, but we're trying to use the car as our customers would, and we're trying to put a lot of miles on them. In fact, we do put a lot of miles on them because we're exercising it in a real world environment with more than just you know, certified test drivers to actually validate the vehicle is ready for customers. And that starts um, in this space that's called saleable. And I also wanna mention that between every step, there is a valve that we go through. We, we call it a valve, it's a readiness review. There is a specific list of deliverables that General Motors has learned over 100 years of making cars that before you go from stage X to Y, you need to deliver these things. And within our organization, depending on what stage you're moving between, there is an individual, a position, that's named as you are the decision maker, right? You decide and you are responsible for making sure this is true if the car is ready to advance to the next stage or at times we say, nope, not ready. We're gonna stay in this stage for a little bit longer because we need A, B, and C, right? And then that valve gets opened and that's actually the gate that allows us to uh, traverse to the next stage. So in saleable, we're building on the line, we're building with all the other models that we make, we still allow a little bit of extra time because a lot of people are still learning, right? The team leaders, the team members, both shifts, everybody that rotates through every job, they need to learn. So we allow a little extra time for cycle time, but when we get to start of regular production, that's when the line needs to be back to rate, right? And that's when it needs to run because we make commitments about how fast we're gonna ship and we ship that quickly out to everybody in the world and our customers. So again, you know, non-saleable, we really want all the quality system to be in place, it is. Before we ever get to saleable builds, we want people to be well-trained, we give them the time to do it right as they try to get into cycle time and to saleable. And then SORP, now it's real. We hit that date, that's the big celebration in the plant, right? It really is. Because now we know we're back to regular, we can run the vehicle down the line. So think about that for a second, right? You have a new car, and it, it could be a one like none car, like the E-Ray, right? First all wheel drive Corvette, first electrified performance hybrid Corvette. Invent how to do that on your assembly line while you're still building Stingray, Z06, right-hand drive, right? Cars, different, for different export models. Convertible, coupe, they all go down the same line. You've been on the factory tour. We're not hiding anything from you, right? <laughs> they all go down the same line. And we have to integrate all of that, and we have to not disrupt that and run the factory, right? And that launch team has no rookies for a reason, right? And so, and I, I think some of my product engineering friends are probably in the room, but to me, they're great partners. They design and engineer a work of art, right? That makes us all excited to drive it and is absolutely fantastic. But all of that is really fancy math and a computer until manufacturing gets a hold of it. Manufacturing, the team in Bowling Green Assembly, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's what takes the dream and makes it into a reality. So I'm very proud of the manufacturing team. I'm very proud of everybody that works in Bowling Green Assembly, and I'm very thankful we have such good partners in design and product engineering. So that is how you launch a vehicle. 
And especially think about what I just said. To me, a lot of our heroes, right, should be folks like John Andrews that I mentioned, or Ryan Trammell, or Michaela, or all the other people that are on the launch team, like Ben is in this photo. Lots of folks are here. They're the ones that took the fancy math in the computer and made it into a real live American supercar. So thank you for that launch team. What a great looking group, right? Really is. Okay, so that's how you launch a car in manufacturing. We do have time for questions and answers, and if you ask a really hard question, I'll probably phone a friend. Um, we'll see. But I also wanted to answer the question that I get asked all the stinking time, which is, when are you gonna relieve the constraints? Are you gonna make more? Has anybody came with that question today? You don't have to raise your hand, I'm just kidding. So here's the thing. 2023 model year, we're producing more vehicles in Bowling Green Assembly than Bowling Green Assembly has ever produced before. More than ever, all right? Now, do we wish we were making more? Are we working to make more? We work to make more every single day, right? But we stretch the supply chain, and then we have to relax a little bit to let everybody catch up. We push again, then everybody catches up, right? But we are making more than every, any other uh, generation or any other time at Bowling Green Assembly. And the intention is to keep that trend going and continue to make more. Because I know, I've talked to a lot of folks that have to wait a very long time for their car, and that's my fault, I'm sorry, I'll accept that blame right now, but I'll also promise you that once you get it, it's worth it, all right? Once you get it, it's worth it, and we're working to make more than ever um, at this moment. So with that, um, I'll open it up to questions. Go ahead. Saleable car and break it down, take it apart. Oh, have, yeah. you, have you build it, do you ever take one and Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. The, the question was, do you ever take a non saleable car apart? Right, absolutely. Um, what's the current status of the UAW union strike? Oh, is there something going on there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. And I shouldn't kidding because it's, it's a very serious topic, right? So this is the every four year um, contract negotiation window that we are in right now. Um, there is a website if you search GM negotiations where GM will post updates and you'll see communication from GM Live if you're interested in what's happening in that space. But I can tell you locally, we're in a pretty good spot because there's actually two contracts that get negotiated. There's a local contract with the kind of local work rules and you know work culture type issues. And then there's a national contract that settles, I would say the bigger issues are economic issues in that contract. Locally, we're doing great. I think we're, we're on pace, uh, very good relationship, very strong team. Um, nationally, I would refer you to the media <laughs> with what's happening in that space where you know a lot's changed since the last contract, so we're in a new space for everybody. We're hopeful that we will reach an agreement, all right? But we will we'll see over the coming days, right? It's it's not long off. So I think it would be interesting next time you get a chance to give this talk to be able to put dates on all those different gateways. I agree. We're not going to do that. So, said, <laughs> so that's something you're just not going to tell us. Correct. Okay. And it's not just, you know, you're our family. We love you, right? This room, you're our family. We would tell you, but we have competitors that study us and try to best us. And the only place we like that to see them is in our rear view mirror. All right? So we don't want to give them more information than they can get already. So we do, right? You know, GM and Corvette, we keep certain stuff close to the vest. Um, to have a strong business case, a strong position in the market, and that's part of the secret sauce is how quickly we can go through some of those steps. Yep. What is the current tack time for the line? The cycle time for the line? We make 188 a day today. Two shifts. Uh, we talk a little more about the supply chain issues. Uh, obviously, since COVID, this has been a big issue for a lot of different organizations. But uh, how do you manage that, and what do you predict for the future? So, what we have, for one, the whole industry is suffering from supply chain weakness. And, and you mentioned COVID, and I would say that um, since COVID started, but COVID is actually still a thing. So the whole industry is seeing weakness, and I'm sure that all of you, uh, because you're auto enthusiasts, have seen articles in the paper about many different models, many different companies that are, have supply chain stress at the moment. In Bowling Green, we are not immune to that. We have the same supply chain stress, and I can tell you that at a leadership team level at the plant, and certainly with tons of support from our headquarters staff, 
We work on it every single day with Corvette taking top priority for the constraint parts. Um, so it is still a thing, but I would point to this graph as evidence that we're making it better every single day. It might not always seem like that from everybody's perspective because demand for our car is also higher than ever as well, which is a real blessing. But we're working on trying to meet that demand by stretching our supply base, by stretching the plant, right, to build as many as we can every day. And it is worked on every single day, every single day. Ray, Ray was, is there a similar process for the engine build area, particularly there for the is, flat plane? There's absolutely a process that mirrors that. And, and I just want to touch on that maybe for a second. Um, so when you think about uh, launching an engine, it is a very similar process, same sort of gates that we go through for what phase is the engine ready for. And I mentioned it at the beginning, but I'd just like to go into detail again about maybe the supply base and maybe even the engine line. So I talked about the, the vehicle plant, right, and the mainline process for launching. When all of that is going on, think about purchasing for a second. Purchasing has to source some part that we're gonna buy from a third party, right? So they have to have the specs, they gotta put it out for quote, they gotta get the quotes back, they have to analyze it, okay, we pick vendor, whatever. We pick that vendor, great. How are we gonna package that part? Oh, we're gonna package it like this. That packaging, believe it or not, with the parts in it, it goes through testing to make sure as that part is shipped from you know, Tennessee to Kentucky, that it's gonna be in brilliant condition when it gets to the plant, right? And then we have to plan, hey, how are we gonna pull it off however it's delivered to us? Where are we gonna store it in the plant? How's it gonna be presented line side? Is that a good condition for the operator to grab it and still install it during cycle time? And then we have to decide things like, okay, now the operator's grabbed the part, now we have an empty container. Is that container reusable? Oh, it is, great, which is what we prefer, right? Why waste anything? How do we send it back? Where do we store it until we send it back? Who's gonna clean it, right? All of those things are getting worked on in parallel as well. And oh, by the way, we also have to work on, is that supplier capable of meeting our quality requirements? Can they run at rate, right? All of that stuff is happening in parallel, multiplied over by many, 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 many times, including the engine as one of them, right? Where we're going through that process for every single little bit and piece. You, you could, hopefully you get the flavor um, from what I'm sharing with you, that when you launch a vehicle, it sends the whole enterprise a flutter with activity, right? Because all of it, and, and those of you that have been on the plant tour, Hopefully you realize that it is a real ballet dance to get the right part to the right station at the right time to build the right car. Because my hope is when you go on factory tour, you will never see a red car going down the line with an orange door, right? <laughs> we don't want that. And it's all this dance of everything being ready at the right time, right? And the engine is absolutely looked at with as much scrutiny. Absolutely, good question. Here. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the status of semiconductor availability now, and do you expect that domestic production might help out? So I kind of missed part of the question there. Could you repeat it? Sure. The first part of the question is, what is the status of the semiconductor uh, supply chain at this point, and do you expect domestic production to help meet your goals? So um, I would answer that semiconductor uh, constraints have improved greatly over a year or certainly over two years ago. That's, we're in a far better space um, with respect to that. And GM has had a purchasing strategy that um, consolidates our plan for semiconductors. I guess the big picture way that I would summarize that, such that it can be more stable and more within our control going forward. Um, so we think that strategy is paying off because we've seen more stability from it. Um, but semiconductors, like all of the suppliers right now, uh, especially as we've produced more than ever, even if times were normal, right? If COVID never existed, if this was just a normal time in life, when you make more than ever of something, it stresses out your suppliers, right? When you have a hit product on your hands, and, and sometimes even our own factory, right? It stresses out everybody because we want to deliver to the customer. And that means that we're taking everything to the limit of what it was designed for, and we're beyond that maybe in some cases um, in the Corvette space, so we work on that every day to relieve those constraints. And semiconductors certainly has been a thing, and it can still be a thing, but it's just one of many things because we're making so many more than we ever have. All right, Ray, last question over here. Last question. All right, last question gets a blackie, Ray Hat. Is it having worked in 1966 in Plan 8 in Pontiac, Michigan in that plant, I will say your plant runs a class act. Oh, thank you. It was clean. We'll You're, take that. Having toured your plant, it's so clean. Art, in 1966, there was so much oil in the air in the engine plant, you couldn't even breathe. 
And we also drilled holes in the station wagon in a, in a Le Mans that was supposed to be in a station wagon when he come through the line. Question, uh, could I you- I can tell you for sure, there's never been a Corvette that came through the line as a station wagon. That's great. That's not happened. We had our problem, we had our problem. I was just an engineering student for summer work in, in quality, quality control and I saw this. Could you address some of the uh, transmission issues you've had? So uh, like, have it like every part of the car, we're continuing to work on yeah. continuous improvement, right? Um, the transmission would be no different from that. I would say that uh, you know we have folks working on that every day as well. The, the transmission um, performs well, but we have opportunity for improvement and we're, we're on it. We, on, on my personal car, 21 Z51, uh, the transmission was literally seeping fluid and they was, so the dealer tells me, and they replaced the transmission. Could you address that? Was that yeah, the that's, vendor that's change? Not something that we would ever expect or want to happen in the field, and I'm sorry that that happened uh, for the car that you're referring to. Um, but we, you know, launch is a great example of that. The whole purpose of all of those stages in launch is to iterate and learn, and to be perfectly honest, prevent um, having to experiment on customers or learn in the field. So all those learning opportunities we take to heart and we deliver a, an outstanding car. Um, but that doesn't end actually at SORP, which is why you continue to see changes throughout production because we do everything we can to make every part um, as good as it can and to delight our customer as much as possible, right? So that, that's the space that we're in from continuous improvement. So hey, I, I want to thank everybody uh, for listening through my presentation today. I'm open to feedback, right, because I'm new to this space, and if you got what you want or didn't get what you want, share that with me. I do want to thank Rachel Bagshaw, who's standing in the back, and John Andrews, who helped put this together for me. And I want to remind you that if you liked the presentation today, my name is Ray Terrio. If you did not like the presentation today, it's Kai Spandy. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you so much, Ray, for your presentation today. I don't know